Welcome to uh, the seminar, Applying What We Already Know. So many times when we go to a seminar, we want to learn more information, get new ideas. Well, you'll get that, but it's not in the general sense that I normally give lectures or presentations. Uh, hi, I'm Jay Sutliff. I'm currently a, a professor in the Health Sciences Department at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. And just to kind of give you a little update here, college professors are used to taking 16 weeks to explain their subject, <laughs> right? And you get 50 minutes or 75 minutes, either two or three days a week, and it's, it's great. I love teaching because if you didn't close the loop the last time, you can bring it back on, on the next visit. Well, today, this is a one-shot wonder right here, okay? So I'm going to try to jam in uh, some information that will be helpful to you and also uh, practical and helping, in the spirit of ASI, sharing this information with other people and helping other people. So as we get started, why don't we pause for a word of prayer? Father, we're so thankful that uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And as we've come together here, you say that where two or three come together, you're in our midst, and we pray for your presence and your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. So applying what we already know. Here's, here's the outline of what we're going to be talking about. We're, well, new health related information. I mean, we've done a really good job in America of getting health information out there. We're bombarded by it, right? Probably too much information. We probably have books on our shelves we've never read, right? I won't, who, who has a book on their shelf that they never read and then yet they buy another one and you buy another one? I have all of those too, right? So we're going to look at all this information, but we're going to try to apply what we already have in our brain. Rather than trying to just add more, you know, build more rooms on, in the brain, we're, we're going to apply this. But it's interesting that I was asked to speak, and I feel it's a privilege to come and share this time with you, and also it's a privilege that you took your time to come here and listen to this. But as I was thinking about this, I really, I had a topic in mind that I've presented to my students a few times, and it's about sleep. I really wanted to talk about sleep, okay? So I was preparing to do my uh, presentation on sleep, and I like to use this illustration right here because I deal with college students. There's people over 25, 30 probably don't deal with sleep debt. You guys get plenty of sleep, right? <laughs> right? But I like to use this illustration of a college student leaving the state of Washington going across Montana. I think Deer Lodge, Montana is where this picture was taken. And this college student running on a few hours of sleep fell asleep at the wheel and he hit the guardrail. Okay, I wouldn't show this if there was, it was a negative as far as really bad, okay? So I said, does this really happen? You've got to go on Snoops and all these websites to find out this stuff. I actually got, I have the newspaper article of the pictures where this actually happened a couple years ago. He was, fell asleep, hit the guardrail. Fortunately, there was not a passenger in, in the passenger side of the vehicle, okay? The guardrail came right through the passenger side firewall and through the fender, okay, and out the back window. Okay, so this is what I was preparing to tell you about, is about how to avoid this. But that's really working with college students. So he had like 70 feet or so of, of guardrail sticking out the back of his car. Okay, this is the kind of stuff I'm used to presenting. But as, as I wrestled with the idea and the topic and uh, the challenging ideas of, of what's going on in, in our health world, I really said, what's the one lecture that would probably be the most important to present? And I think it is, how do we apply the information we already have? And so really want to talk about how do we make behavior changes that last for a lifetime. So that's what we're going to look at. So growing up, I grew up in a uh, home in North Dakota, almost Canada. And so if you hear a little bit of that coming through, that, that's where I'm right on the Minnesota, North Dakota, Can Canadian border, right up in that corner there. So if you hear some of that coming out, you know why. Okay. But really, I was, I was taught that you need to go to, my grandpa drilled it into my head that I had to get a college education and do better than he did. Okay. Well, I've got a lot more education now than my grandfather ever dreamed of having, and I'm, I don't think I'm doing any better than he did. He had a work ethic, and he, he was practical. Plumbing, welding, he taught me all the trades. Okay? But I was told that knowledge is power. Is that, is that what you have heard? <laughs> have, have, you, have you bought into that concept? I work on a college campus where we're trying to tell everybody that they need to get a college education. They need to get a four-year degree to really amount, and then we give those charts. If you get a high school diploma, you make X amount in your lifetime. You get a two-year degree, four-year, and all these things. You, you've seen those charts? How much more money? 
So, so we bought into the concept, especially in America, that knowledge is power. So we go and we get knowledge. Information age, what a great time to be living. I mean, in our pockets, we have more information than we'll ever dream of doing anything with it. So the knowledge is power. So I bought the concept. So what is it that we know? Okay, we have health knowledge. You know, I, I didn't grow up in the Adventist church. Okay, but it was, it was on a prayer meeting. I was actually a college student at North Dakota State University and was invited to an Adventist church. So I went, and I went to prayer meeting, and it was in January, and the pastor's wife got up and started talking about health. They said, it's time for our health what? Nugget. So here we're, I'm a, I'm a nutrition student at the local university, and I'm going to church, and all of a sudden, the, the, the pastor's wife pops up like a jack-in-the-box, goes up and does her health nugget. And then she sits back down and we got into the Bible study. And I just said, what, what just happened? What, what's the connection here? A total disengage in my mind of what, what's this doing in a church? Okay, Health knowledge over here. It didn't take long to go to the potlucks where we had breakfast cereal in a box with cheese all over it for lunch. <laughs> Special K. I thought, this is really interesting. These people are into health. They've got health nuggets. They have healthy lunches. They removed all the meat. And I thought, this is just really interesting, because I'd never heard of a religious group. And even through my undergraduate degree in dietetics, I became a registered dietitian, I never really heard about Adventists. And I never heard about the connection between health and spirituality or any of that stuff. Okay, this is back in the dark ages, like 1985, back, at, back in there, okay? So health knowledge, what do we know? Okay, did you know that the, that food, food guide pyramid right there, the old, several generations back, was the most recognizable health education tool in America. Most recognizable. I mean, we came out with this as the USDA. We all paid for this, US citizens. We paid for this. And we put it out there, and then we changed it every couple years. right? And now we're into the what? What do we have now? It's the plate. We went to the plate, right? Chooseyourplate.gov or something like that. But really, this is most recognizable. Would you say the health profession has done a good job of getting the word out just about health knowledge? The word's out. I mean, can you, tr can you stop a person on the street out there that wouldn't tell you, I need to eat more fruits and vegetables, and I really need to exercise more? Probably, I mean, is it, is it a lack of knowledge? So I think in, in, a, in a positive sense, we need to say, hey, we did a good job. And I think the Adventist church stands right up there with that, of helping with that. Okay? We came out with a vegetarian pyramid. We've come up with an exercise pyramid. I mean, the pyramid is the most recognizable health education tool ever invented. So I think, I think we all kind of, you know, in a sense, collectively get a pat on the back. And then we know the New START principles, right? I, I love that acronym, right? Or acrostic, whatever, it, whatever it's called. We, we know that one. We know that stuff, right? And we tell our worker, co-workers, our neighbors, we do seminars. We have a whole institution based on the New START principles, right? On the left coast, we're out there at Weimar, okay? And then what we have... The media gets involved. Now, the media, sometimes you have to keep an eye on them. They'll, they'll take a little snippet out of an article and blow it up, right? So now we, we, I could have came here and told you about the 64th nutrient we have found now in broccoli that helps prevent cancer. So not number 63, but number 64. So we could spend time talking and debating, and then we get all these different things. But really, the media, the health educators, we've done a great job of getting the knowledge out, OK? And then, didn't we love it when they came out with the Blue Zones? Huh? Have you all heard of the Blue Zones? Five, five regions? And then anybody from Minnesota here? They're actually trying to create a Blue Zone. They tried to create a, do you hear about this? And, and then the whole state of Iowa is on board. They're trying to make Iowa a Blue Zone, the whole state. The governor said, you know, enough is enough. Kind of like Huckabee did in Arkansas a few years ago. Okay, so now we've, we've got a blue zone in Loma Linda, California. Fortunately, I live with a blue zone. My wife was born in, in Loma Linda Sanitarium. <laughs> that sounds old, doesn't it? And I even went over there for a conference not long ago, and I took a picture of the building, and I said, here's your crib. <laughs> but really, I mean, as people, it's generally the knowledge and looks like the practice is working. But did you know that in every one of those blue zones, the, the, the researchers, the epidemiologists, the demographers are concerned? What do you think is happening in those blue zones? Western, Western, 
Western lifestyle, they're concerned that the lifespan of the next generation is going to be shorter than the one now. In fact, we're seeing some of the research in America across the board that the lifespan of our children and our grandchildren is going to be shorter than ours. First time, it's kind of like it peaked, right? And it's coming down now. So how are we doing? We've got all this knowledge. I mean, you can't pick up a new... I'm, I'm riding on the airplane here yesterday, and I can't, over, I can't help but see the Arizona Republic newspaper in the... In, in blood sugar and dementia. You're, you know, I mean, it's everywhere. Health information, it's, it's, it's more chia seeds, you know, or whatever you're into this week, right? I mean, really, I mean, it, it's bombarding, okay? So I thought it would be interesting to say, let's give ourselves a report card as Americans. In 1985, the Center for Disease Control and Prevent, it's prevention now, did you notice that? that that's been added a few years ago maybe several years ago. Center for Disease Control, and then they added end prevention. Okay, 1985, they started doing telephone surveys around America, and they asked people two questions for this portion. What is your height, and what is your weight? And so we came up with, we've come up with the body mass index. My students hate body mass index. Why would they hate the body mass index? I mean, they write reports on it. What's that? Yeah, body mass index makes me look or on the ch category I'm what? I'm overweight, obese. So when you, when you look at this, you're like 18.5 to 24.9 or 25 is ideal range. So it's your height and your weight into this formula. And when I used to teach uh, college in Nebraska, the students used to say, yeah, but I, I come from hardy stock. <laughs> you know, and mom used to say, yeah, he's just big boned. Right? <laughs> He's big boned. But this is only one measurement of a person's overall health. But really, when you look at the, at the studies, okay, health care costs uh, proportionately go up with your BMI. Did you know that? The more earth you take up, the more you cost. Okay? <laughs> is, that, is that a good way to say it? What's it? Your feet don't get, well, they need to support, okay? So the body mass index, 1985, this is the, believe it or not, this is the first year I took a nutrition class. I was a college hockey player. I went to college and they said, uh, what, what do you want to take? I said, hockey. And they said, well, you need to take classes to stay eligible to play your hockey. So I was looking through the calendar one time, the, the, the course, and I said, oh, that nutrition class looks pretty good. At the end of that semester, I knew I was done playing hockey. I knew I was not going to do very well with that. I would do better with studies. So the first year I took a nutrition class, only part of the states, see the white states here, okay? It's kind of like a, just thought of this, like a political thing, right? Red and blue states, okay? These are white and blue. The white, white states, the, the, the states did not participate in the data collection, okay? Down in the, here, this is 10 to 14% of the adults, okay, had a body mass index equal to or over 30. So that tells me that the person would be considered not only overweight, they'd be obese, if you're over 30, okay, 1985, okay, some of you, how many were born after 1985? We'll see what's happened since you've been on the planet, okay? Now, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a little bit protective of this because, you know what, I became a professional like in 88, so this is happening on my watch, is the way, I, I take this personal. How many of you are healthcare professionals, health educators? I take this personal. This is happening while I have credentials. I'm a registered dietitian who should be at the forefront of this. Okay, check this out. So my home state of North Dakota, we were weighing in <laughs> at 10 to 14 percent over here in this uh, belt over here. Check this out. Watch as I go through these slides. 1985, 1986, 1987. Okay, the darkening of America. Yes. Right over here. Look at, them, look, at, look at North Dakota. They, they, they got on a health kick or something. You know where North Dakota is, right? Yeah. Right up there? <laughs> Just checking, okay? Anyway, so then uh, we got into it there, and that's 89. Look what's happening since 85. 89, 90. Got dark again. Yeah, okay? Long winter. A lot of blizzards that winter, okay? Look at that. We added a category in 1991. 15 to 19% now of these dark colored states, okay, are considered obese. These are the trends, okay? 1991, 1992, Arkansas and Wyoming are still holding out, okay? Watch this, Wyoming, 
I used to have a lot of students from Wyoming, and they said, you know what they told me? We're too busy counting mule deer. We have more mule deer than we do people, okay? <laughs> We have, more, we have more coyotes, mule deer, and antelope and elk in Wyoming than we do people. We don't care what size they are. We've got lots of room to spread out, okay? But really, what, what we're looking at here is this is one indicator of health, but it's a major indicator of health of really how large people are, okay? Then they finally got on board. Wyoming finally started reporting in 94. But look at this, 95. There's something about this continental divide right here, right here, okay? So I tell my students, move west, move west, okay? I meet, oh, what happened there? Oregon, Nevada, Idaho. And they get, we added another category in 97. So what's, what's the trend, obviously? We're getting larger, right? And so really more people need to move to like Wyoming and places where there's more room to spread out, really. 97, there's 98, okay? There's 99. Okay, we want to we want to blame what high fructose corn syrup. We want to video games, all these different things, whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of studies for everything, right? Like Colorado is the leanest state still to this day, and Mississippi is is the largest. Okay, this is 2000. We had another category. So if you're walking down the street in 2001 in Mississippi, every fourth adult you meet is obese, not overweight. Not big boned, not a little pudgy. We're talking large, okay? Health knowledge is increasing, and so is the body weight, okay? It's proportionate. Look at then we still we we've got a little bit more, and then we got over here in West Virginia, and we got Indiana joining the group. They were felt left out, so Indiana jumped on board. Still, the continental divide. Something's going on here, okay? 2004. Added another category in 2005. Over 30% of the states, okay, down in here are considered obese. And then we add a few more. 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. And this is, this is, this is the Bible belt down here. Think about that. Okay, that's just, just tidbit for thought. And that's the last, last year that I could find the data on. You can find these slides. I'm going to post these slides. Later, I'll give you a website that you can have these slides. Or if you want to give me a thumb drive, I'll give you the slides if you want to do them, use them for health education. You can go to the CDC's website and get these slides. Download them. You got them? Yeah. You can just go right on there and get them. You can even get the ones for where diabetes or diabetes is what we call it, where diabetes and obesity overlap. So this is, this is the outcome of more health knowledge. This is what spurred me on to, let's talk about how can we collectively, for ourselves and for other people, help them make behavioral changes in their minds, in their bodies, and overall. So how do we take this and put it actually into action? So I'm going to propose to you that knowledge does not necessarily equal power. Knowledge plus action is where the power is at. So we're going to spend the rest of the time now, how can we take action to actually apply what's already in the brain? Okay, so let's look at it. So we're on number three on the handout, if you're, if you're following the handout. Number three, Roman numeral three, adherence, relapse, and lasting behavior change. How many of us start out on January 1st making resolutions? Maybe we quit doing resolutions. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's, it's uh, in vogue right now. Not, I'm not making resolutions. Resolutions, yeah. Isn't it kind of vogue to that? I don't do that anymore. I'm bigger than that, right? Or whatever, right? Well, maybe you are bigger than that, right? <laughs> okay, no pun intended there, sorry. But the biggest loser, we love those programs where we watch people have victory over these different things, right? But then they do a, they do a story on them in the very last pages of some other magazine, People Magazine, they say, here they are five years later, right? And they show them. Okay? I would like to see a program where they actually bring people out who have maintained their body mass index over a lifetime. People probably wouldn't watch it, would they? It's not as exciting. So let's look at, how about the word adherence, adhering to, sticking to something? Okay? That's what we're looking at. Relapsing, falling back, okay? backsliding, whatever you want to call it, lasting behavior change. So the first thing we want to look at is that I was looking at this from a, a professional standpoint, I, on my watch, 
this is happening in America. I took it personal. What can I do? And then I went and I worked with Dr. Hans Deal at his uh, Rockford chip, chip program when he was first launching it out there. And uh, he had introduced me to some of his guests. He says, this guy here, he's been back three times. This guy over here, he's, but he's just coming back for the knowledge. He says, it's just stimulating, right? And then he'd say, oh, yeah, and this guy here has been through three of my programs. And so we've got repeat offenders coming back to our health programs, right? And then a little while later, I was working at the Black Hills Health and Education Center, and we'd give the discount to these people who would return back to the wellness program for a victory lap, you know, to do, do it again. And I said, what is going on here? We know what's predictable when you follow the eight natural remedies, and we're focused on getting the cholesterol down, right? Getting the blood pressure down, getting the diabetes normalized, and that's what's real to the people. And it works. I mean, the first few months I was at the Black Hills, my wife and I were working there, I, I, I would sit there and watch these people weep in two and three weeks what they could do in their lifestyle and what would happen in their bodies, how their bodies would respond in that short a period of time. People who have been, you know, insulin dependent diabetics, type 2 insulin dependent, okay, they would reverse it after 38 years in two and three weeks. But then we'd find out later on that, no, they're right back to where they started three, four weeks later. So it really aggravated me that we really couldn't help these people long term. So I started saying, what is this that we can do, that we can help these people? So we start, I started looking at science and behavioral modification, right? And then how many, anybody in psychology here? This is really dabbling into psychology. So I'm really kind of stepping over here because I don't really have the training in psychology, but really it's so much in the brain. So you start looking at theories and strategies to help people. How many of you have heard of the social cognitive theory? Okay, just read about that? This talks about how um, successful and prepared are you to make those changes. People come to our stop smoking programs, okay, right? Are we preparing them? How uh, successful can they be based upon how, what their self-efficacy is? How efficient can they be at this new behavior? And then we look at environmental factors. Okay, you pull somebody out and you send them to a health program like Weimar or Black Hills or something like that. You just, you, they come to your center and then what do you do at the end of three weeks? You wave bye-bye to them and they go back into their old environment. Okay, how successful is that person going to be? They've pulled them out of their environment, put them back in there. Okay, another theory. This is the one that we teach the most at the college level, the health belief model, and we use this a lot because it really involves primarily the motivational, attitudinal components of perceived susceptibility. Okay, you look at your family tree and you say, yep, uh, mom has heart disease, dad has heart disease, grandpa and grandma had it, I'm probably going to get it. Okay, I better change. We use that a lot because it's based on numbers. Western medicine is totally focused on numbers, right? for the most part, mainstream. So we're looking at changing numbers, getting weight down. We're, we're number oriented. And so we, we look at this and we say, you know what, you're, we even have a, you've been on the websites where you can go on there and predict how old you're going to be. We do that kind of stuff and it motivates us to change a certain amount of us. And some people, that really clicks for them. They get a scare. They get a checkup. I want to be around for my grandkids. That kind of stuff. That's the health belief model. Okay? You don't have to know these names on there, but they're just kind of concepts you already know. Okay? We just happen to give them titles and, and some people write books on them and things like that, right? In acronyms, okay. Excellent. Now, how about the theory of reasoned action? This has to do about your attitude and based upon your social norms. One of the blue zone principles is to hang out with people who have the same lifestyle. So in your social circle, is it, is it more acceptable to practice a certain behavior or not. So it's kind of like peer pressure. So I'm just featuring a couple of different theories or strategies that people use to help others make changes or for themselves. They adapt these, these have you heard of these? But you, you kind of know the concepts. You see that? There's peer pressure. There's the perceived risk. How likely am I going to have a heart attack, get diabetes, those types of things. Uh, how, we, how efficient can I be? How successful can I be? Uh, there's also another one called self-determination theory. How determined in your gut are you to do this? And that's where a lot of us guys, you know, we're, we're left brain dominant. By George, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to gut it out and I'm going to do it, right? No emotion involved at all, right? Okay, so how about all the uh, books, articles being written right now on habits? How many of you read a book on habits? 
in the last year. Have you read any of these books? Have you read? You haven't? Okay, well, we'll talk about it a little bit then. Okay, the whole idea behind, how about the book called The Power of Habit? Talking about how we can actually change bad habits and make good habits. There's different philosophies on that, and most of the time when we're trying to change a bad habit, what are we focused on? The bad habit. So we're focusing on not eating ice cream. I'm going to quit eating ice cream. So what do you think about all day? Can't eat ice cream. Can't eat ice cream. Can't wait till my birthday so I can have some ice cream, right? Or that wedding. Or, but you're thinking about the bad habit all the time rather than saying, what can I eat? You're saying, what I can eat. Okay, I'm focusing on food because I'm a dietitian, kind of a natural progression there. But really what we're finding in this book is a pretty good book, The Power of Habit. It talks about there's, we need to take a cue. So when you do something already, you have a keystone habit that you add something to that habit you already do. Most of us shower every day. So before you shower, you have to work out for 15 minutes. So before my shower, I'm going to do 15 minutes of workout. And then what we do is we do get in the routine. You get the reward from it, feeling good, feeling better, maybe losing weight, whatever it is. And then it gets this loop going. So that's the habit loop. And some of that works well for some people. And then you change environments or you move or something like that and you get out of that habit. But some of us have doing things for so many years, we don't even realize we're doing them. That's the point here, okay? Now, a study at Duke University said that more than 40% of the actions people performed each day weren't actually decisions, but habits. Now, think about that just for a second. 40% of what we do every day doesn't even really compute in the brain. We just do it automatically. That can be good or it can be horrible, okay? So think about the habits that you have. If I asked you right now, what shoe do you put on first, your left or your right, would you know? Right. Do you know? Right. Do you ever thought about it? Right foot. Right foot? Yeah. Left foot? Okay. How about uh, when you get in the car to drive, do you, you, you go through all these rituals, you put on the seatbelt and things like that, and you don't even realize you're doing it. You go into a room and then suddenly you're looking for your keys and you're, you did this habit thing of setting it down somewhere, right? But then you all of a sudden got a hook on the wall, and the minute you walk in the door, you put them on the hook. That's habitual or automaticity. Okay, so check this out now. Check this out from behaviors of becoming automatic. There's a word I want you to stick in your mind right now called automaticity or automatic. Look at it. Some automatic processes do not require any, check that out, any willful initiation and operate quite independently of conscious control. Think about that. We, we do a lot of things that we don't even willfully do or we don't even think about. Does that concern you at all? <laughs> okay. These processes can be instigated by stimuli of which we are not yet conscious or by stimuli of which we were recently conscious but are no longer. And I think of this because a lot of times at the, towards the end of a semester, a student will come to me and want to try to improve their grade the last week of the semester. And they go into their automatic stimuli without even thinking about it. Maybe it's worked for them since first grade, second grade, third grade. They start crying or doing whatever kind of habit they've done for so long to try to get me be convinced that they really need a better grade. Okay? So that's what I started thinking about. But think about some of the other things that maybe you do. Here's, here's a classic example. When I was uh, just getting down with college and starting my professional career, my, grandmother, my grandfather had passed away, and my grandmother was still living in uh, the house, and it was a large house, and she spent half the year in Arizona. And so she said, my house sits empty half the year since you're moving back to town and just getting started. Why don't you live with me? And I thought, no, I can't go back. And she says, why don't you live with me? And I said, okay, I will. <laughs> and so I did that, and I kept her house and so forth. So I lived with her for a couple of years, and uh, I moved. I was getting ready to get married, so we, we bought a house. And I moved into the house ahead of time so it could all be ready and so forth. Not thinking about it, driving home from work was things on my mind. Where did I drive? Yeah. Drove right into Grandma's driveway. And so I covered up. Hey, Grandma, I thought I'd stop by for a visit. OK? <laughs> no willful. I was totally distracted. OK? And so it's kind of disheartening to think that you're driving 75 miles an hour, three feet away from people, going down the highway, and, and they're not even willfully thinking about what's going on, not to freak anybody out. OK? So we're thinking about the automaticity of our actions. 
Think about that. That's where I want to kind of go now. We're looking at all these theories. We're looking at changing the environment, helping people make changes and things like that. So what we want to start looking at is different things now. How many have read the book, The Outliers, or have seen it? Have you seen this book? Fascinating book on things that fall outside the curve of the normal types of things. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a chapter in there where they talk about the 10,000 hour rule. Okay, well, you've done something for 10,000 hours, you're an expert. Bill Gates, by the time he founded Microsoft, he already had 10,000 hours of uh, programming. He and his buddies were sneaking out at night in Seattle, going over to, like, there's only like, two or three mainframe computers in the United States at the time, and he was sneaking out because it was available from, like, midnight to five in the morning. And they were spending five hours, and their parents couldn't figure out why they couldn't get him out of bed in the morning. He was just crawling back in when it was time to get up. The Beatles, when they hit the United States, I guess they were just a sensation. They'd already put 10,000 hours in playing clubs over in England. They have different stories in there, 10,000 hours. So really, we can do these things, and, and you do it, and you're on autopilot. Don't even have to think about it. But try to change that. My point is, you've got these boutons, these, these, these bouton pathways in your brain that you've been doing for so long. You must have seen it in your stop smoking programs. People are used to doing this, and suddenly, what are you going to do with that hand that's used to going like this and smoking? So how do you change the behaviors? How do you replace those behaviors? So we've got to look at it, and I find in Christ's object lesson, page 356, is actions repeated form what? <laughs> Habits. Habits form character, and by the character, our destiny for time and for eternity is decided. So suddenly it goes from being somewhat humorous to being very, very <laughs> convicting. What do you do with that? How do you make those changes? And how do we even know that we need to change? Okay, we probably all have things we already know. As you age, you have more pronounced habits, right? And you know more clearly what you would like to change. Okay, the last theory under this section, section uh, Roman numeral three, I want to share with you uh, a, a theory or a strategy that is probably the most researched strategy and probably the most successful strategy that we can, we can actually use or adapt into our lives. How do you make changes? You can't see it there, but it says pre-contemplation. How many have seen this? It's called the trans-theoretical model, uh, stages of change, uh, readiness to change. And you can actually use this in your own life. Okay, Check this out. Right up here is, is pre-contemplation. Uh, somebody isn't even aware or even desiring to change something. Okay. What, what do you want to use? What, what habit? Weight loss. Weight loss. Person says, you know, not even aware of their weight. They, they're, they're wearing moo-moos and, and, and expandable waist slacks or whatever. They're not even aware of it, not even a concern to them. And then suddenly they contemplate it. They see something on the news. They, they, they see the, the slides from Mississippi and everywhere else. And they say, oh, maybe I should consider that. So they start to think about it. And then we'd say, oh, wow, I'm going to make that change. I'm going to lose some weight. He starts preparing for it. Yeah, I should probably do that. I'm going to start January 1st. Okay? And then on January 1st, you actually take action. And then if somebody, according to the, this, this stages of change, at six months, you've been doing something for six months, you are now in the maintenance mode. Okay? Does this make sense? Now, so many times, well, I'd like to put this in the context of somebody coming to one of our health seminars. Okay? They, they got drugged there by their spouse or their significant other or something like that. They weren't even, they, and then you wonder why they didn't stick to the program, right? This, is, this, is, this explains part of the reason because when someone comes to our health seminars or even us, we're at different stages of this change. And you say, oh, this is just, you know, this is a bunch of malarkey. Just get in there and gut it out and all this stuff, right? But see, a person comes along. I think about when I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I was studying nutrition, and even when I joined the church, I didn't really understand quotes. I didn't know what the health message was. I just, I just thought you don't eat unclean meats and those types of things, right? And so I, I joined the church, and suddenly a little bit later, I started hearing some things. I thought I was eating a really good diet. I was into bodybuilding and hockey and all this stuff. And so I thought, oh, I've got a pretty good diet. But suddenly I started feeling convicted a little bit that maybe there's something more about this. So I started, I started contemplating it, and then I jumped right over preparation, and I jumped into action. Sounds like a left brain male that didn't get married until he was 30. That's what I was, right? So here I'm about 25, 26 years old, going to graduate school. I'm contemplating, saying, hey, I'm going to try to experiment with changing my diet. 
And I, I, I went from pre-contemplation to contemplation, jumped over preparation right into action. What do you think I did? I did this. I relapsed. Okay? I backslid. Okay? So what did I do? Did I go all the way back to pre-contemplation? I didn't. I actually went back here and kept contemplating it, and then I prepared. You know what I actually did? I said, well, I guess, I guess I'll just try being a vegetarian for a while. So I went and I got some green salad, brought my lunch to work with me, and I went and bought a big block of tofu, okay? Just threw it in the middle of my green salad, and I said, I guess this is a vegetarian, okay? <laughs> I was going to skip right over that special K loaf with, with all that other stuff on it for lunch, right? Breakfast for lunch, and go right into it with tofu, a big chunk of tofu. That lasted about a week, okay? And I went back and I said, you know what, I, need to, I really need to go into this preparation stage, okay? And I prepared, I took action, and I said, okay, Daniel only needed 10 days to prove himself. I need 30, okay? I'm going to do this. I committed to 30 days in 1989, okay? I'm still on the 30-day experiment, <laughs> okay? But the first time, I, I, then when I saw this model here, I could see myself on there that I'd skip some, skip, skip some of these stages. And we ask people to do this. How about an evangelistic series where somebody comes in, they don't have a clue, they, they see your handbill. We just had a... We just had a uh, uh, a prophecy seminar in Flagstaff, and people are walking by because we're right by downtown, our church, and it, it, we're roping people in. There's one guy convinced some guy on the street to come in. He ended up getting baptized. We haven't seen him since. Okay, he he wasn't even he wasn't even contemplating, and we put him right over here into the action mode. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not underestimating the power of the Holy Spirit to convict people and to change people's lives, and that 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 can happen. But so many times we do a disservice and we, we take this guilt and shame like we're failures. But really, you've got to realize that we all go through this stages. Maybe they're faster. And think about this. Think about, here's a classic example, Nicodemus. Where was he at? Nothing wrong with me. Right? I'm a Sanhedrin. Wasn't he the highest ranking theological person? But suddenly there's something in his head. He heard John the Baptist preaching. And he went to Jesus by night and he contemplated it. Okay? And he disappears from the scene. Three years later, finally, he's been preparing. He takes action. And who basically funded the early church? By and large, we're told Nicodemus had a big part to play in the church. Okay? So I think all of these models are excellent. And if you can use them, click them in. But what the interesting thing is, is a lot of them are based upon behavior modification. Modifying your environment, and I'm not downplaying that. Okay? Modify this, modify that. You know, put your tennis shoes next to your bed so that when you get up in the morning, you trip over them so you have to put them on to go for a run. I mean, all that stuff, if it works for you, go for it. Okay? But I think that it, it, it's really interesting. And then what really pushed me over the edge is I was getting ready to write my dissertation for my doctorate. You have to write this big paper. And I thought, I'm going to do a dissertation on adherence, and I'm going to pick exercise. And I thought, you know, you, everybody that writes a dissertation probably thinks they're going to change the world by writing this paper, right? And then, my, then, then you're, if you have a good advisor, they say, you know what? Do something that you can get done, okay? <laughs> do that later when you're getting paid somewhere. Do that big study, right? So I contacted this guy named Rod Dishman. Every, everywhere I turned, everywhere I looked, he was the guru on exercise adherence. He's a professor at the University of Georgia. So I emailed him. Within 24 hours, he answered back. My side of it said, hey, I've been reading a lot about you. have been reading your books, your articles, and stuff like that. Could you give me some insight on a little part of this research on adherence that I could study and, and write my dissertation on? He wrote back within 24 hours and said, I quit doing that. <laughs> I got out of that five or six years ago. I was too frustrated with it. But good luck. <laughs> okay? So many good approaches, helpful, but really even modern science. But then I suddenly realized, aha, uh -huh, I read this in Ministry of Healing. Apart from divine power, no genuine reform, see that genuine? Deep reform can be affected. Human barriers against natural and cultivated tendencies. Do you have natural tendencies towards things? Do you have things that you've cultivated and, and, and made yourself? Natural and cultivated tendencies are but as the sandbank, sandbank against the torrent. To get a picture of that. Okay? Not until the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing power in our lives can we resist the temptations that assail us from within and from without. So these theories are good. 
And the, they may even go in deep, okay? But most of them, it's Ministry of Healing, uh, page 130.5. It's on the, on the website, so it must be halfway down the page, okay? So really, what it's saying here, apart from divine power, all these things, in a sense, are somewhat, and I don't want to downplay this, but they're kind of Band-Aids. But think about that. Have you ever been around a flood? We lived through a flood in North Dakota. The, the, the Red River runs north into Canada, right on the North Dakota-Minnesota border. And, yeah, it floods up there all the time. We had, we had 107 inches of snow, nine blizzards in 1997, and we got flooded. And we lived a mile from the river, okay? We went over and our friends' houses are just totally wiped out off their foundation. That's what it's saying here. Human barriers against natural and cultivated tendencies are but as the sandbank against the torrent. So many times when we look at these things and when we're trying to share health principles with people, we're trying not to come across as too religious or too spiritual. And so we kind of keep Christ in the back pocket till we're down the road. Don't you think? Yeah, we, we don't want to be religious. We want to focus on the cholesterol and the high blood pressure and all these things. We want to help them get that down. But really it says here, if we're trying to make changes, okay, it says that we have to have that, that, that vitalizing power from Christ in us to actually make changes in our lives. Otherwise, it's like throwing a sandbag against a big river coming. That's the Christian advantage. So when we look at the Christian advantage, as Christians, we should have, in a sense, the ability to overcome our habits much more so than other people who do not have that power in us. Okay? It says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Think about that. The Holy Spirit of God is actually living inside us, and this is the vitalizing power of Christ. When Christ went away, he said, I'm going to give you another comforter, and I'm going to give you power. Okay? He is in you whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So we're, we have two people. One's a Christian. One's not a Christian. The non-Christian's using all these behavior modification uh, techniques and things like that. and may be more successful than the Christian who's really not using and tapping into and allowing the power to work through them. That is the Christian advantage, Roman numeral four or five. Four. So... What we need to look at is really, when we look at behavior change, there is a great controversy over our habits. Think about that. Our daily habits are actually involved in this great controversy. Think about the first temptation in the garden. What was it? Use the senses. Use the food. Use the appetite. And then the first temptation of Christ? Same thing. And look at this. This is, this is really powerful. Christ knew that in order to successfully carry forward the plan of salvation, he must what? He must commence. He must begin the work of redeeming man just where the ruin began. Now get a load of this. Adam fell by the indulgence of appetite. And in order to impress upon man his obligations to obey the law of God, Christ began his work of redemption by reforming the what? The physical habits of man. And so many times we, we separate we're separatists. We separate the mental over here, and, we, and we're kind of, we've kind of grabbed the Western medicine philosophy that we need specialists, right? You go over there and see the mental health person. You go see the physical health person. You go see the social health person. And then, oh, and then go to the pastor over here for the spiritual health. We divide these out, and we, we partition them out, and we take them out of context. I'm saying we need to bring them back for ourselves, and when appropriate, we bring them back into the whole picture for other people. But look at that. He began his work of redemption by reforming the physical habits of man. So I want to focus on that now. And it says the declension in virtue and the degeneracy of the race are chiefly attributable to the indulgence of perverted appetite. These are the daily habits. The things we eat, the things we do, the things we view. We don't even realize we're doing them. We're automatically doing these things. Okay. So, what does scripture say? All these theories here, a lot of them deal with modifying our behavior. Okay? But we find that Paul says in Romans 12 that we should be transformed by the renewing of our what? Our mind. Okay? Don't conform, but be transformed. So, we're looking at these theories can help you modify your behavior, but you're always looking forward to that indulgence until you get off the diet. Right? And that craving. But here what we're talking about is transforming the mind and in a sense that metamorphosis, that changing of the mind, okay? 
So when we start looking at how the brain operates, okay, you've all seen these different slides about what's going on in the brain, different parts of the brain, fascinating stuff, okay? But we look at the frontal part of the brain, this is really where we're talking about uh, making changes and willfully changing our habits. This is the key, okay? Scientific studies show that the frontal lobe, right up here in the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is where our spirituality, our morality, and the will resides, right up here in the front part of the brain. Okay, so when we start looking at that, we look at, have you seen these slides? No. Oh, this is fascinating, check this out. So the prefrontal cortex, or the frontal part of the brain, check this out, a cat, this is by total brain mass. A cat's frontal lobe is 3.5% of the total brain, okay? That, right? That makes sense, okay? The ladies, ladies generally like the cats more than the guys. Do you ever notice that? Okay? But look at this. If you graduate up and get a dog, he has double the frontal lobe, okay? That's why you can train a dog but not a cat. Part of the reason, okay? And that's why there's more cats hit, I think, on the highways than there are dogs, okay? But you take a chimpanzee, 17% of its total brain mass is considered the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain. That's really the engine of the whole body, of really, of, of making those morality, spirituality, and those types of things. Obviously, my dog, I have a, we just got a dog not long ago, and he's my running part, she's my running partner. Love the dog to pieces, but you know what, it's still a dog, okay? Chimpanzee, 17, look at the human brain, 33. But we willingly surrender parts of our frontal lobe through our lifestyle habits. Some of those types of things. All, all the different toxins in the body and all the different things that we consume directly affect the frontal lobe. Okay? So we're looking at that. And so now I want you to look at your, the back page of the handout. What we're going to look at here, and this is a diagram. When I first became an Adventist Christian back in 88, I soon became aware of Light Bearer's ministry, and I found a, a diagram similar to this in one of the handouts by Ty Gibson and James Rafferty. And they showed this to try to explain what's going on here. Here's our senses. This is the outer shell of the body. The hearing, the taste, the touch, the smell. That's our senses, okay? Think about your senses. Right now, we're, we're, we're touching things, we're hearing things. How about, how about you go into a room? There used to be a, a, an office assistant who I could tell if she was in the building or not at work. I could smell her perfume, okay? Okay, so now when I, hear, when I smell something similar to that, I think of that lady. She's retired now and, and so forth. But anyway, so our sense is here. But check this out. When man came from, from uh, the hand of the creator, he was, it was perfectly balanced. And the upper part of the brain, okay, or I'm sorry, the upper part of this, 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 uh, this uh, figure here, the higher faculties is what governed Adam in the beginning. He had intellect, conscience, and reasoning. Those are the higher faculties. There was an exercise of the will that he had, a, he had a, a, a pathway of using that. Once man fell, this was severed, and the default now is that we are governed by appetite, passions, and our desires. This is what Paul talks about when there's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. This is it right here in, 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 in the picture. Okay? So think about this. We have 33 to 38% of our brain, okay, mass, really wanting to be governed by this, okay? But so many times we've been doing things for so long that we're being controlled by our appetite, passions, and our desires. Now this is the flesh, in a sense, and this is like the spirit. This is the battle that goes on all day long. Does this make sense? Okay, so then what we look at are these evil down here in and of themselves. An app do you need an app? Is it good to have an appetite? Yes. Should we pray that the Lord takes our appetite away? No, I don't think so either. How about our passion in the right context? How about a passion for, for whatever it is you're into, running or whatever you're into, okay? Desires, do, do we want to get rid of our desires? Okay, this, this is really a, a lower faculties. Are, they're not negative in and of themselves. What they were intended though is to be governed by the higher faculties. So let's do some terms here. The will. Think about the will and the power of the will. The faculty by which a person decides and initiates action, it is that which exerts conscious control over a person's behavior. Remember, we can get in such habits that we bypass that will. Hopefully, we're bypassing it into the higher faculties that we automatically are in tune with the will of the Lord and that we're functioning up there. But unfortunately, I don't know if you're like me, but I, too many times, suddenly I'm on my third piece of pie 
before it kicks in that I'm eating my third piece of pie. Have you ever done that? So there's more people here that, okay. So, and then these other things over here, okay? So what else about the will? So it's really about our will. And some people say you just need more willpower. Well, how do we strengthen the will? We're going to look at that. The will is what brings the mind to rational or physical action. Okay, so these are some terms to understand what's going on here. And the will is the power of choice. We have a choice. Okay, but remember now, we are governed typically unless we make a conscious choice and we allow Christ to take control of our mind, okay, we're going to be controlled by our appetite, our passions, and our desires. That's what's going to govern us unless we make a conscious choice of allowing the intellect, conscience, and reasoning that's in harmony with the Lord to control us. Okay? So this is God's avenue of approach. He comes to us. He says, come now and let us what? Reason, Reason together. He, he intellectually wants to talk to us. He wants to uh, discuss with us. He wants us to make intelligent, informed decisions. But on the other hand, Satan doesn't care. He'd rather come down here and entice us with visually stimulating things, things that we put in our mouth, things that we put in our bodies and different things like that. He's operating down here. He's using the senses and he's using the lower faculties. He did it with Eve and he's been using that and that's why he used it on Christ right away in the wilderness. He says, I've been getting people for 4,000 years. I, I just used the breads to stone thing. You know, I just throw it out there and he's like, whoa, what happened there? Okay, so really think about this. This has been riveted in my mind since 1989 and it's been the best way that I can find to have victory over habits and changing lifestyle patterns is right here. And hopefully it's, it's a benefit to you. I'm just passing it on. It's, it, it's not original with me. Okay? So think about the lower faculties. Okay? I think they fit nicely into 1 John, where it says there's, there's three things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are our biggest downfalls right there. You can be categorized into three categories. The seductive power of Satan uses these to access us through our carnal nature and our senses. So let's look at them individually. Appetite. That's not just necessarily food. Anything that lust of the flesh, strong desires, indulgence, anything that's contrary to the will of God. Okay, that's what Satan's using. He's enticing us. Secondly, passions. Appetite, passions. That's the lust of the eyes, the mental pleasure stimulating through sight. You can't hardly go onto a website now and, and you're trying to put the blinders on. You can't even, you can't even read the newspaper online without some, somebody with something missing on their clothing, trying to, you know, popping up and bouncing around. And fortunately, Congress has stopped some of that stuff, okay? And now we've got desires, the pride of life. How about the materialistic satisfaction with worldly goods? Pride in our titles and things like that. So now let's look at what I thought would be really good to look at is look at some examples, some biblical examples of three individuals who had actually examples for us who have who had victory over appetite, passions, and desires. The first one I want to look at is Daniel. Daniel 1.8. He gets taken captive into Babylon. And what do they want to do? What, what does the king want to do right away when he brings people into his kingdom? Give them the best. Now think back there. Wouldn't this be like a five-star restaurant in the day that Daniel's invited to? You can have what the king is eating. You can have what President Obama and... and, and Vice President Biden are eating. If you can eat it, they're, that's, what, that's what they're being invited to. They've got private chefs. Here, Daniel comes in, and he purposed in his heart ahead of time that he would not defile himself. He had a habitual pattern from his childhood, and he continued to live it when he got into the crisis. He did, you know, obviously, there was other things going on there. There was a food sacrifice to idols and things like that. But he decided ahead of time that he would not, what, defile himself. He purposed ahead of time. Another example, how about somebody with passion? How about Joseph in the Old Testament? Second in command, right? And what's happening to him? What, 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 how's he being enticed? Potiphar's wife is pushing his buttons. So it's interesting, too, that Daniel was probably a teenager, wasn't he? 16 to 20 years old. Joseph, probably similar. Somewhere in there, around 20. Figure? Think about that. He's in his prime of his life, and he's thinking, man, I can have this. She had to be a hot babe. I mean, I would think that the king <laughs> the guy, you know, would, would have probably a really attractive wife, right? But she's probably not getting the attention, whatever. And what does he say? How can I do this great wickedness and do what? 
sin against God. Is he using his higher faculties? Is he using intellect, conscience, and his reasoning? Did Daniel use intellect, conscience, and reasoning? These are young men, and we usually say, oh, those are the years you just go sow your wild oats. These guys are in, the, in their young prime, and they're still allowing the higher faculties of the brain control their actions. They're automatic for the higher nature. Okay? And then the last guy, early in his career, okay, talking about, think about, you hand, I, I think Solomon was in his early, early years too, right? And he was handed the kingdom keys. And what does he say? Oh, man, I can't wait till I can get a few Rolls Royces and all this. No, what's he say? He says, give to your servant an understanding heart, wisdom and knowledge, to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. He's using his higher faculties. Now, if you want to read where he wasn't using his higher faculties, go read Ecclesiastes. Right? That's where he switched. Somewhere in his life, he switched gears and stopped functioning in the higher faculties. He switched gears. Three perfect examples of how we can have victory over our habits through these three different major channels that Satan uses, whether it's appetite, passion, or desires, kind of grouped together. So, we're going to try to wrap up here. Paul says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't need to use worldly strategies, even though they can be helpful. We don't have to look at these carnal things because our weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty where? In God for pulling down what? What's a stronghold? What, when you think of a stronghold, what is a stronghold? Fortress. Okay? They're, they're embedded. How many of you have strongholds in your life right now? Right? But it says that don't fight them with carnal weapons like January 1st. <laughs> Those types of things, if those help support. But really, he says, we need to go to spiritual warfare here, pull down these strongholds, and he says, really, pulling them down, there's actually a word in there that says to blow them up with dynamite. And then there's a word called dunamis, dynamite. Okay, The only dunamis I know on this, on this planet that can really blow up those strongholds is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and living out in us. So he pulls down and casting down every argument, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing how many thoughts into captivity? Okay. This is a spiritual warfare, and we can't be fighting it on the fleshly, carnal level. That's the bottom line. Okay, so our carnal weapons, our strongholds, our fortresses, our castles, we're casting them down. So here, let's get a plan of action. How can we actually strengthen the will? So we can actually give our bodies an opportunity to overcome our cultivated and inherited tendencies. Number one, link my will with the divine will. And God actually even says he'll do that for you in Philippians. He says that both to will, he'll give you the will, right, according to his good pleasure. He'll give you the desire and he'll actually do it for you if you allow him into your life. Number two, make a commitment. A little bit more on that later. Provide an environment for success. How many of us have set ourselves up for defeat by taking in different things and exposing ourselves to things in our lifestyle habits that are really, we're, we're sitting ducks, and the enemy is just playing with us like, like, like a cat plays with a mouse. Our, our lifestyles. Are we actually practicing temperance and balance and abstinence in our lives? How about be punctual? I was just reading a study of the day that the more punctual you are, the stronger your will is. Simple little things about being on time. Okay? Being on time. Now, if spouses are here together, don't look at your spouse on this one. Okay? <laughs> don't be doing the elbow thing. <laughs> okay? Uh, how about... How about... Because if my wife was here, I'd be tempted to do it. <laughs> uh, practice deciding things. How about how many times you sit and waffle and waver and things like that. I think there's even some, some quotes in Ellen White that talks about how we weary the angels by the, the, you know, not making a decision. Okay? Uh, practice deciding things. Stick to your decision after you've weighed it out. These types of things actually strengthen your, your, your will. And you put it on the side of God being able to work through you and giving you the power. Okay? Number six, complete each task before beginning another. We live in this world where job descriptions say, must be able to multitask. Okay, and the brain researchers right now are coming out and saying that you technically cannot, in the true sense of the word, multitask. 
your body's constantly flipping off and flipping on switches when you, when you switch your mind and you do these things. Possibly you become so automatic doing it, maybe become more efficient. But initially, when you're trying to do more than one thing at a time, you're turning one thing on, turning the other thing, and you're constantly switching switches. Okay? And why do you think we have so much ADD and ADHD going on? We've got all this stimulus going on, and our brains run in many different directions. Okay? Do the disagreeable things as soon as possible. Get them out of the way. This is, this is all about strengthening your will and overcoming bad habits. Read deeply and thoughtfully, stretch your mind to understand and retain what you read. And here's a big one too, roll out of bed as soon as you wake up after your planned hours of sleep. Constantly procrastinating actually weakens the will, okay, and gets into procrastination. Number 10, operate your life by plan and not continual impulse, delayed gratification. These are all things that work together to strengthen that will so that God can actually work through you and actually help you overcome the habits that we are so ingrained with. Okay, so we're wrapping things up. We talk about Paul talks about, and this is, this is one of my last things. You know, so many times we'll look at athletes. Like I think of Michael Phelps from the last Olympics, most decorated Olympian ever in any sport. And we look at his training record, how he trains every day, 5 a.m. And when he finally retired, he said, I can't wait to sleep in, right? Bobby got up at 5 anyway, right? But we look at him and we applaud him and we, we have goosebumps when he's touching off. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I mean, the American spirit comes out, right, in the Olympics. And we, we applaud them, okay? And I think that's what Paul's talking about here. Do you not know that those who run in a race or swim a, swim a race, all swim but one receives the prize? Fortunately, in Olympics, three get the prize, but you get the idea. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in how many things? You look, at, you look at Michael Phelps' training record, what he does with his life. How about these Olympic athletes with the shooting? The, yeah, yeah. The, his is, yeah. Now he's on subway. <laughs> if that's going to happen, right? And then you look at these guys who shoot the rifles. They don't take in any caffeine or alcohol because they don't want it to be twitching, okay? That's what he's talking about here. Look what the athletes will do. And he says, and they do it for what kind of crown? A, a, a crown that perishes. Now they do it, obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Paul's talking about boxing here. You know, shadow boxing. He says, I'm not beating the air. I know who my enemy is. It's right here. And it's out there. But he says, look at, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, we applaud Michael Phelps and all these athletes, and we love it. But if, but if a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, wants to follow a strict health message, they're a legalist. What's with that? We love the athlete, and we'll put posters up, and maybe even give money to the, the Olympics and stuff like that, and just applaud them along. But the guy comes into church, and he says, no, I, 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 don't, I don't go to Starbucks anymore. Oh, you legalist. Right? Michael Phelps is going for this perishable crown. We're going for an imperishable crown, and I'm not saying we should go into the legalism thing, but I see so many people that are still so, so afraid of being a legalist that they're intemperate. And the devil plays with them like a cat and a mouse. So, the commitment advantage. I think this is, I, at first when I was preparing this, I kind of thought, this is kind of childish. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. I'm bringing back the temperance pledge. I kept reading, and it's interesting that when I, when I first came, became a Seventh-day Adventist, I had been a member of another church that had a modern prophet, and so I didn't deal with Ellen White right away when I became an Adventist. And I was asked to give my first health seminar, and I said, I can do that on autopilot. And someone gave me a book, Councils on Diet and Foods, and it changed my life. When I was preparing this, this seminar, I went back to Ellen White again to see what I should present on, and this, this information is coming a lot through the inspiration of Ellen White, and she kept talking about taking a temperance pledge. Now, when you think about that, what do you think of? Prohibition, right? I mean, I'm taking you way back, right? You're trying to go for the iPhone 6 that isn't even out yet, and I'm taking you back before iPhones. And I thought, you know what? It's interesting, and I kept feeling impressed that we need to take a temperance pledge. How many things have crept back into our lives, whatever it is, food, behaviors, computer, and I thought, that's interesting. Why, why does the Lord, because I even asked my wife, I said, is this corny? Is this, is this immature to have people take a temperance pledge? 
And I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. And I have this study that was done in, in uh, 2013. I had it sitting in my folder because I was pulling down documents off of a search engine. And I pulled it up and I thought, what's interesting? They did a hotel study, okay? It was in California. And the guests came in. Have you ever been into a, a hotel where they are trying to get you to help them conserve energy by not having your towels washed every day? Well, they did a study and they said they, they'll just place little placards in, in the... Uh, in the rooms saying please conserve and if you don't want to use your towel and stuff like that and then they took another group and they did it a step further and they they told them about it and then another group they took and they said hey do you want to do you want to do that and they said yeah I'd like to do that and they said here can you sign this document take the pledge and then they did they signed it they gave them a little lapel uh, pen that said you know I'm helping conserve energy by not using towels every day okay so they went from you know just putting it in the room and then the next group, they actually, they, uh, they asked them about it. And then the third group, they actually had them sign on the dotted line that they were actually taking a pledge to use less towels and to help them uh, conserve energy. You know what they found out? When guests made a specific commitment to practice sustainable behavior and received a pin, I mean, it sounds kind of childish, doesn't it? Like my temperance pledge, right? It's like it says, received a pin to symbolize that commitment. Their subsequent behavior was significantly more eco-friendly. They used a lot less towels when they actually wore the pen and signed the pledge as opposed to just saying, yeah, I'd like to do that, or they agreed to it, or was in the room. And then they went a step further and they said an increase in desired behavior was observed only when the commitment was detailed, specific, and it was action-oriented. It wasn't a passive thing. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to take the temperance pledge or take it home with you and prayerfully consider what is it. Specifically, do something okay, that you're committing to that's detailed, specific, and it's action-oriented. And you actually post this somewhere, we're actually accountable to it. What do you think about that? So there's your temperance pledge. I'm going to post this, these slides, and uh, this stuff on my website, and I'm just going to, I'm going to share with you in a minute here. There's my website, and I'll just warn you right now that it is not a commercial website, it's only a place like when I speak at conferences or I want to do a handout of some sort, it's called fullcircleofwellness.com. And I'm, I'll send this to the guy who does my website for me, and he'll post this handout, the notes, and he'll, hand, he'll give you also the slides. But remember, I'm not selling you anything on there. It's not even a commercial. It just has basically, it's a placeholder where I can put handouts and put slides up for your viewing. Okay? It's called the fullcircleofwellness.com. So, let's close now. What is that other diagram that I've given you there? If you're really, if you're a health educator or you want to make a difference in your community or help people make change, I think the new way we need to look at that idea is really that when we look at, you can call it whatever you want, wellness coach, lifestyle coach, life coach, whatever it is, really we need to start thinking of ourselves more in helping and coaching people to make these lifestyle changes. And I think rather than being the authority and, and, and you know, waving the finger and doing all this knowledge and stuff, we need to come up next to people and actually help facilitate the change and be a coach that actually helps them along. On the left-hand side here is, is the handout you have, and you can modify this. Basically what you have, you have people take a look at their whole entire life, and this is basically a satisfaction. This gives you a barometer of where people are at. So many times when I was a Bible worker and doing evangelistic work, we would go door to door looking specifically for a Bible study. And we felt like failures if we didn't have Bible studies going, right? And then we, we would, we would uh, run into people that had all kinds of other issues other than what our, our specific Bible study was about. And so really then we, we go in there and they turn us down and we go away thinking, oh, we're a failure and that type of thing. When you actually ask people what's important to them and you actually work with what's important to them, you create that trust and that relationship with them that hopefully leads to the whole gospel message. So that's basically a life coach in looking at that, and I just wanted to make you aware of that. And on the right here is if you fill it out, this has been, this has been a phenomenal uh, revealing thing in my own life. Where is my satisfaction? So what you do is you draw lines, like in this category here, significant other. How satisfied are you in your relationship with your significant other? This person is at a nine. Okay, Fun and recreation is a four. See how you draw the lines there? The physical uh, environment, is that an eight? Their career, six. Money, seven. 
Health and well-being is a four. Family, nine. Friends at an eight. Personal development and growth is at a six. So if you walk up to this person and you start talking to them about enhancing their marriage, you say, well, they say, well, I'm already a nine. I don't need that seminar, right? Rather than that, you say, hey, you know, let's look at this. This, this is supposed to be a wheel here. This wheel's kind of lopsided, okay? So maybe we need to work. Maybe this person right here would probably come to your health and wellness seminar. Or possibly you're doing something over here and trying to help them with recreation. So this is just a tool to try to help engage people to actually help them make the changes in their life that they're interested in and it's not necessarily your agenda telling them what they need. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so I think really when I look at this uh, whole concept here, I think this is the, the, the new quotes, what we call the Bible workers. The Bible workers really need to start looking at their careers or their profession as more of a life coach and helping the people, first of all, where they have the need. And these types of tools can actually help you define where their needs are at. And then we can intervene with them and actually help them facilitate lasting lifestyle changes. Okay? So, take the pledge when it's appropriate, specific, detailed, and commitment. Okay? I'll take some questions if, if, if you still have some energy left. I'm kind of yakking on. So remember, I got 16 weeks typically to tell you this. Did it in 70 minutes. What was yeah. number 10 on the plan of action? Number 10 on the plan of action. I haven't I memorized them yet. Plan. Operate your life by plan. Yep. Not continual impulse. Okay. Does that help? Do you have a question here? Okay. Where did these come from? Have you heard of the book called Healing the Broken Brain? Uh -huh. By, uh, it was a professor at PUC uh, um, several years ago. Chalmers? Chalmers? Eldon Chalmers. I, some of this is just from my own study, and then some, some other ones were helped with uh, the book called Healing the Broken Brain. It was published back in the mid-90s, I think. That's a, that's a good book, too, to look at. It's really how we can actually help uh, heal the broken brain of sin. Is what it's it's about. Thank you for placing this material on your website. And your slides are here, even the reference you're given about Professor Elman. Oh, okay, that's probably from a presentation at Lightbearers last year. A different one. There's more slides on there too. Yeah. And if you want the actual, those are PDF. If you want actual slides and you have a jump drive, I'll give you my slides too. I mean, I like to share the information and if you can use it. Comment or question? Yeah. I can give you the slides. Is that will that help? Okay. Well, uh, okay. Hopefully tomorrow or by Monday I'll have the slides up too. Do you have something back here? My contact information. Oh, it's on the front page of the handout on the bottom. If you need to email me or have a question or something, yeah, feel free to. It just dawned on me the other day that temperance is actually a gift of the Spirit. It's not something that you can oh. manufacture. There's a good point. That's a good point, too. Temperance is actually the gift of the Spirit. And, and really, you add to these things. Remember in 1 Peter? Talk, add to your knowledge and, and temperance and all these things. It's adding them to it. Okay? How about, how about how, anybody want to add anything to what was said? Maybe from your professional and so forth? Yeah, go ahead. Moses. Oh, striking the rock. No. Oh, oh. He could have been a king. Okay, I could have used him as an example. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Where, where Moses actually used his higher faculties too. Yes. He could have, been, could have been the next pharaoh. Yes. He could have been entombed rather than trans or resurrected. <laughs> right? He was looking at the imperishable crown. Excellent point. Any other comments, feedback, input? I'll be hanging around if you want to talk some more. I think I've talked enough. You're a professor in, in Flagstaff. So yeah. You teach nutrition. I teach public, health. You teach public health. Yeah, we don't have, I teach some nutrition, but we don't have a nutrition program. We have a public health program. Uh, undergraduates. Yep. Have you heard the study out of Tallahassee or some research that they did that they're using uh, to give to uh, medical professionals to help them help people stop smoking has to do with readiness and willingness uh, and their, 
they're scoring themselves on these things and, and then having conversations based on that. So almost almost like the circle. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's excellent, excellent comment. Look at this. Think about the person the, the, think about your audience the next time you do a health seminar or some kind of outreach. Think about the idea of people coming to you if, and everybody's at a different stage of change. Think about that. I kind of skipped over it because, because of time, but there's a, there's a right, right here. Think about this. Think about a person coming to your seminar who's not even aware of Bible prophecy or health changes or something like that. And they come in and then they quit coming and they come and, and you think, oh, we just need to give them more information, more information. They may not be ready to go to the next stage. So you just friend them and you, and you do different things like that. Now the person who's actually, uh, this is pre-contemplation, this is contemplation, you decide what, what's the barriers from helping this person go to the next level. Sometimes it's not giving them another study on which, which day of the week is the Sabbath. They've already got that. Now you might have to talk about, yeah, they're thinking, I can't pay my bills and now I've got to ask for time off on the Sabbath, I might get fired. I mean, we, those typical things. Okay? So motivated to change. How can we actually help facilitate people to go to the next level, to the next level? And it's interesting that the research that's done on how many days does it take to change a habit? How many? Seven? 21. That's the common thing. Do you know where that came from? A study done in the 1950s on a, by a plastic surgeon. Okay, and we perpetuated the 21-day thing forever. Our, our, our lifestyle change programs are about 21 days because we think it's 21 days and boom, they've got it now, send them, send them on their way, right? 21 days, maybe if it's 21 days of drinking an extra glass of water, they actually find that over, over a long span of time uh, that really it's more like 80 to 90 days and the more complex the habit is, the longer it takes. Somebody's been smoking for 30, 40 years in your programs. You're thinking 21 days and we got them, right? So... Don't feel like, and the other thing is, I think we have to discern between the two things, between condemnation and conviction. So many times we're convicted by things in our lifestyle, and we feel condemned. What's it say, what's it say in Romans? There's now no what? Condemnation for those who are in Christ. Conviction is one thing. That's from the Holy Spirit. But condemnation is not from Christ. So if you're convicted about something, we so many times beat ourselves up and condemn ourselves because of our conviction. So, again, this is one presentation. Some of you could probably do a better job on this, but this is really one to kind of kickstart you to get you going. And hopefully it's been helpful. I'll post the slides if you want the slides, all those things, the temperance pledge. And I'll hang out now. We probably need to cut this off so these people can go eat, go eat lunch, right? One more question. Okay. They, they, they start on change and they get results and then they move right back. Yeah. But I realize that behavior change is not always very easy, but people move back and forth until they get, they realize, they learn every time they Exactly, get, exactly. And then finally they get on the road on the straight and yeah. narrow path. And yeah. that, I think sometimes we're impatient. Absolutely. We don't lose, even though somebody may not make that change right away, storing knowledge and yeah. you're giving them something that yeah. they can fall back on. So it still is helpful. Uh, see, and see, when you relapse, some, you don't relapse all the way back. Don't. You don't go all the way back here. No, in our, in our Do studies with Stop Smoking. Dr. Weaver's been doing the Stop Smoking programs up in Detroit area yeah. for 40, 50 years. Yeah. That, so this is a guy that probably should have been presenting today. Right. <laughs> had quit 3.8 times. Interesting. So it took them several times. No, I say on yeah. the average, yeah. when people were off for a year, they had quit smoking for a short period of time. Yeah. For at least, uh, at least 3.8 times. Wow. That was the average. Well, exciting thing. This kind of closes, closes the loop. When I was in high school, n not anywhere near even knowing what a Seventh-day Adventist was, my parents went to a stop smoking program. And my dad was breathed free ever since. My mom later, 3.8 times later, <laughs> okay? But my parents, I didn't even know where they were going. And I, and I later on joined the church and actually started doing stop smoking programs. And my dad says, that's the program that I, we went to that helped us stop. And then, and then the guy that didn't stop when, when my dad did, he came to my seminar with my dad to try to get him to go again. 3.8 more times. Okay. 
Okay, let's close, and then we can, we can chat, all right? Father, thank you that uh, we're so fearfully, wonderfully made, that you've given us these higher faculties that can govern the appetite, the passions, the desires. And Father, we use these biblical examples, and we look at our friends and our family, and Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to change us into the image of Christ again, and that you'd move us along at your pace. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.